Good morning, church, and welcome to this week's Take 5. This morning, we're going to begin a brief track through the book of Hosea, the first of the minor prophets. Hosea lived in the tragic final days of the northern kingdom of Israel, and his prophecy was primarily directed to this corrupt and idolatrous northern kingdom. Now, while all of Israel's prophets were called to convey a dire message of judgment to God's people, Hosea was unique in the sense that God called Hosea to live out this message in his own personal life. So let's go ahead and read today's passage and find out the first words that God spoke to Hosea. So this is Hosea 1, verse 2. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For, like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So the first thing we see here in this passage is that the Lord began to speak through Hosea. In other words, Hosea did not utter his own thoughts, nor did he necessarily seek the thoughts of the Lord. But rather, the word of the Lord came to Hosea through divine initiative. God initiated And the first words that God spoke to Hosea were not a message or a warning to the people of Israel, but instead was an instruction for Hosea pertaining to his own personal life. Go, he said, and marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. Now, I can only imagine that Hosea must have been both stunned and heartbroken when he received this word from the Lord. I mean, marrying a harlot is not any man's dreams, and it was been particularly tragic and particularly disheartening in that day. So why would God ask such a thing of Hosea? Well, this passage we just read actually tells us. God says, for, or you could replace that word with because, like an adulterous wife, this land, referring to Israel, is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. You see, Hosea's marriage was to be an acted out parable of God's relation to Israel. Hosea would find out firsthand what it felt like to marry and take a beautiful bride, to provide generously for her, to protect her, to love and to cherish her, only for her to be unfaithful to him time and time again. So if we go on and read the rest of the book, which I certainly hope you will do, we find that Hosea was obedient to God, and he indeed marry, uh, indeed did marry a woman named Gomer, who conceived and bore Hosea a son. So God tells Hosea to name the son Jezreel, which is a foreshadowing of a judgment on Israel yet to come. Gomer conceives again and births two more children, not clearly known to us if they were Hosea's children or not but whose names also symbolize the judgment of God that harlotry always begets. The children are eventually told to drive the unfaithful mother out of the house. She runs off and takes up residence with another man. God then tells Hosea, go again. Go again, he says, and love a woman who is a beloved of a paramour and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the people of Israel though they turn to other gods. So Hosea once again is obedient to God, and he goes after Gomer, paying half, paying the other man half the slave price to bring his wife back. Hosea actually purchased his, his own wife from this other man. See, just as God would not give up on Israel, he intended for Hosea to symbolize his undying love to Hosea's wife of harlotry. God's command to Hosea is to love her anyway, even though she's a harlot, and to love her again, even though she's continually unfaithful. When we think of what, um, for just a moment, of what God asked of Hosea, we get this glimpse of the unrelenting love that God has for us, even in our most wretched state. Church, the hard truth is, that just like Israel, we are Gomer in this story. We too are enslaved to this world, to pleasure, ambition, to money. We too are idolaters, taking our pleasure in things other than God. We too are adulterers, repeatedly being unfaithful to God. Just like the Israelites, we too 
live as though we are not God's people. Pastor John Piper puts it harshly this way. He said, in God's eyes, everyone who forsakes the Lord is a whore. Everyone is either fully married to God or is a prostitute. But the good news, church, is this. God has not cast us off. He continues to love us anyway. He continues to love us again and again and again. And he was willing to pay whatever the cost, the absolute highest price, the blood of his only begotten son to bring us back. So when you are reminded of your failures, how little time you've spent in God's word, how burdensome prayer has been to you, how many other things of this world you find pleasure in rather than God, remember that even a wife of harlotry can experience a new relationship of righteousness, of justice, of steadfast love, mercy, and faithfulness, because our God is a God of redemption and restoration. And every dark, distorted, and damned stain disappears beneath his river of grace. I love you, church. I hope you have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you again next Monday.